while perusing a couple of YouTube videos the other day, I noticed there was a couple of videos on a on a phenomenon called the pectoral gap. Uh, apparently, this is some something that's uh, showed up in a couple of uh, professional wrestlers. It showed up in a couple of bodybuilders also. Uh, I, I, I think one of the more pro one of the more prominent wrestlers that this uh, this uh, malformation of the chest showed up in is a wrestler called Scott Steiner. Uh, you wrestling fans fans out there probably know who this guy is. I quite frankly, I don't <laughs> I don't follow professional wrestling at all. I haven't the slightest interest in it. Although when I was a kid, when I trained at a gym in uh, Manhattan called Mid City Health Club back in the mid '60s, that gym was uh, very popular with all the top professional wrestlers at the time. I became friendly with a lot of them, uh, including a guy named Bruno San Martino who uh, I, I think at the time he was the heavyweight champion, and I used to do bench press workouts with him. And uh, I was actually written up in a magazine because when I was 14 years of age, somebody saw me doing bench presses uh, with Bruno. And uh, at 14 years of age, I, I was uh, using 320 pounds, which is a pretty good amount of weight for that age. Uh, but anyway, I, I just want to add real fast that uh, these professional wrestlers were terrific guys, uh, Some even the guys that were the villains. When you met them in person and spoke to them, they were just just wonderful, wonderful people, great people. But that being said, I don't watch wrestling. Uh, I have no interest in it whatsoever. Uh, you know, if that's your bag, that's great. It's just, uh, but anyway, this this particular pectoral gap phenomenon has apparently showed up in several wrestlers. Um, I have a fo uh, I have a picture here which I'll show you. This is basically what it looks like if you can see this. I'll hold it up right to the camera. Now you notice in the bottom photo, the top photo you see like a fairly normal pectoral development. In the bottom photo you can see the pectorals have kind of like moved off to the side and there's a gap right in the center. Uh, and this is this is basically, that's the pectoral gap phenomenon. It's basically typified by a drifting apart of the pectoral muscle, muscles. Notice they, they kind of drift outwards. Uh, this produces a large gap in the center or sternal portion of the chest. And as I said, several videos have uh, have been uh, uh, you know put on YouTube trying to explain uh, the cause of this, and um, some of them make pretty good sense. Uh, and uh, I've come across a couple of uh, well, actually only one scientific paper. It was in the form of a letter sent to a sports medicine journal, and uh, this is what I'm going to discuss here in this video because this particular letter, to me, explained the most rational reason. To explain the pectoral uh, uh, gap phenomenon, uh, what the videos claim is that it's caused by repeated microtrauma to the pectoral muscles and the surrounding tissues, and this can occur with, uh, you know, wrestling moves or, or long-term uh, bodybuilding, and that does make sense, uh, you know, because the trauma can lead to a shrinking of the pectoral muscles along with a lateral displacement of the medial or central portions of the pectoral muscle, and those are moves outward. Uh, you know, there's various maladies that can cause changes in the uh, appearance of the pecs, including pec tears. Pec tears are much more common than this uh, pectoral gap phenomenon, and they're usually caused by uh, when you're doing bench presses. You know, when you're lowering a very heavy weight, uh, the, there's a tremendous strain on the pectoral muscle in the eccentric portion of lowering of the bench press, and that's usually when pectoral tears occur. Uh, However, none of the existing causes uh, that explain structural changes in the pecs, in other words, various other situ uh, conditions that can cause changes in the appearance of pecs, none of these really explain the pectoral gap phenomenon. And to understand the possible causes of the pec gap phenomenon, uh, you need to know that, uh, about, a little about the pectoral muscles and how they're innervated by nerves. And there's two major nerves that branch out from a larger nerve called the brachial plexus. The medial pectoral nerve penetrates through the pec minor muscle. In other words, this nerve goes right through the pectoral minor muscle, which is kind of like towards the top of your chest right over here, you know, the pec minor muscle. This nerve actually goes right through the pec minor muscle, and it innervates the pec major muscle, which is the big pectoral muscles of the center of the chest, right? Now, the, the lateral pectoral muscle... Uh, lies in the fascia on the lower side of the uh, pectoral muscle. And those, those, these nerves are basically embedded in either, you know, these nerves that, that kind of stimulate the pectorals, 
are embedded in either muscle itself, they go past through muscle, or they're kind of embedded in fascia, which is kind of connective tissue. So if there's any trauma to that fascia or the, or the muscle, you know, if there's, if there's something that causes scar tissue to form uh, in the fascia or the, or the or muscle where these nerves pass through, it's going to basically cause an impingement of the nerves. And, it, and when the nerves get impinged, that means the pectorals aren't getting nerve stimulation. And what's going to happen then is they're going to atrophy. And in the case of the pectoral major, when it atrophies, it, the, the entire pec doesn't shrink. Instead, only the distal portions, the portions closest to the sternum or center of the chest, they tend to atrophy and, and the pecs spread out to the side. So, uh, you know, chronic injuries or microtrauma to the pecs resulting from constant workouts or impacts such in, in wrestling can lead to insufficient healing, which can in turn lead to a nerve impingement syndrome. In this instance, like I said, the pectoral nerve that pierces through the pec major is compressed and may even have a lot of scar tissue or fibrosis that prevents optimal nerve stimulation of the pectoral muscle. Okay, you know, basically what happens then is, again, you have a, a nerve impingement that leads to a lack of sufficient nerve stimulation of the pectorals. The, pe the, uh, the, central, the, part, the part of the pecs closest to the sternum or center of interest, they atrophy. They basically disappear, and the pec spreads out to the side, and that's the pectoral gap uh, appearance. Uh, now, you know, now the pectoral gap appearance is, isn't that common, but similar types of damage have been shown to occur in certain shoulder injuries where there's an impingement of the nerves that serve, let's say, the deltoid muscle of the shoulder or the infraspinatus muscle of the uh, rotator cuff. When that happens, you also get a localized atrophy of the muscle because, again, it's not getting adequate nerve stimulation. Now, the question that arises after all this is what can you do about it? You know, the full extent of this pec gap phenomenon isn't fully known, and there may be a genetic component involved. And the reason I say that is because, uh, you know, I've been involved in bodybuilding for uh, about 56 years. Uh, I, I competed as a bodybuilder, and I covered m major bodybuilding contests all over the world, uh, national and international, when I wrote for magazines such as uh, Joe Weider's magazines, and I, well, not I am it, but Joe Weider's magazines, I'd go to contests all over the world. And I, I quite frankly, I, I very rarely saw this pec gap phenomenon. I, obviously, guys had different pectoral shape. Some guys have lower pecs. Some guys need upper pec, blah, blah, blah. But I never saw this pronounced gap where the pectorals are literally, you know, moving off to the sides. That was very rare, which makes me wonder if there's some sort of genetic component. Why didn't I see this years ago? In other words, I've been involved in many, you would think I would have seen a lot of this over the years, but I haven't. But there's the one bodybuilder who, who it did appear in is a German pro bodybuilder, this huge guy, Marcus Rule, who I think he's retired now. But if you look at photos of him in his last couple of contests, he had the pec gap. So, you know, I think in his case, it was repeated trauma to the pectorals from his regular trainings. It's just as far as I know, he, he didn't do any professional wrestling. Uh, so I think that one way you could possibly uh, avoid this pectoral gap, and this is strictly uh, this is strictly a guess, it's strictly speculation on my part, but I think that, you know, overtraining the chest or pectorals, using too much weight, using sloppy form, where you're dropping the weight, you're not controlling the weight, this all kind of uh, tends to increase microtrauma or small little injuries to the chest muscle. If you get enough of these little microtraumas, which a lot of times you won't even feel, it's just small little tears in the pectoral, eventually you're going to have the scar tissue formation. And once you have the scar tissue formation, it's going to start to impinge on the nerve that serves the pectorals, and then you're going to have the pectoral gap. Again, this is speculation on my part because there's literally no research on this at all. You won't find if you do Google, this this appears nowhere. It's strictly based on my experience and what I think could be possible. Uh, so uh, as for the wrestlers, the professional wrestlers, there's not much advice I can give them there because you know, the wrestling maneuvers, like where they jump off the, uh, you know, the uh, pole there and they smash into each other in the ring. I mean, you know, People always say that wrestling is fake, pro wrestling is fake, but I know a lot. I've known pro wrestlers over the years, and I can tell you, these guys get real injuries. 
I mean, a lot of it, is, most of it's choreographed. I mean, it's called entertainment. You know, I mean, there's a reason why it's called entertainment. However, things can go wrong. When you're doing those type of wrestling maneuvers where you're jumping and flying all over the ring, things can happen unexpectedly. And, you know, the, the, the movements that these pro wrestlers do where they slam their chests and, you know, this into the buckle on the side. But they're going to, a lot of these guys, I think eventually will have this pectoral gap phenomenon. And I think this also explains why the pectoral gap phenomenon has thus far appeared mainly in professional wrestlers. So what can I say? There's not much you can do about it. Again, but the biggest mystery to me of all uh, concerning the pectoral uh, gap phenomenon is why it hasn't appeared more often than it does. I mean, there's a handful, this guy, like I say, this guy Steiner and a couple other pro, pro wrestlers, they show the pectoral gap phenomenon. Uh, but, you know, why hasn't it shown up in so many more wrestlers who do who engage in the same movements? Why hasn't it shown up in, in so many other bodybuilders who overtrain their pecs, use too much weight, do sloppy form? Why doesn't it show up? That, to me, is the remaining unsolved mystery concerning the pectoral gap phenomenon. And to that, <laughs> I have no answer at all, although I, I do suspect that the pectoral gap phenomenon will probably be more likely to show up as you get older, where the recovery ability is lessened. In other words, the ability to repair muscle and recover from injuries tends to decrease with age. So I think that this is something that will show up more in older bodybuilders and older wrestlers. When I say older, I mean over 40. And this probably also explains why I almost never saw this in the bodybuilders who I saw competing, most of whom were in their 20s and 30s. So that's about it. That's my take on the pectoral gap phenomenon. If you want uh, information, the best information anywhere, I guarantee it, on nutrition, supplements, ergogenic aids, hormonal therapy, uh, uh, exercise science, anti-aging research. There's a lot of interesting research coming out now about uh, anti-aging that is particularly applicable to those of us who are engaged in weight training. For example, they just came out with a study the other day. Uh, I did a video... Uh, Gee, I guess it was about a year or two ago, where I talked about the uh, the uh, comeback of Kevin Levrone to professional bodybuilding when he competed in the Mr. Olympia. Uh, Kevin's a good friend of mine. I think he's one of the greatest bodybuilders ever. However, Kevin came back, uh, made a comeback at about age 52, if I recall. And the one thing that was noticeable in his Mr. Olympia comeback was um, he wasn't he wasn't, at, you know, to be expected, he didn't look like he did when he was in his 20s. But the really noticeable thing was his legs. Uh, I found out later after I did that video that Kevin suffered a knee injury where he was actually not able to train his thighs at all for the last three months for the contest. Of course, that was the major explanation for his lack of leg development when he appeared in the Olympia. However, I also should, should suggest in the video that and this is something I've noticed in, a, in just about every body below as as they age, the first muscles to go are the lower body muscles, the legs, the thighs, uh, and I suggested in the video that it, it had probably had to do with a lack of what they call motor neuron stimulation in legs. The motor neurons are the, are basically your connection between the brain and the muscles. The motor neurons innervate the the the, uh, the muscles. And if the muscles don't get enough motor neuron stimulation, again, it's almost like the pet gap found the muscles atrophy. And, and a, a study that just came out this week confirmed what I've been saying and writing for the last decade, which is to say this study showed that that older that uh, older people tend to lose 30 to 60 percent of their motor neuron stimulation of their legs, which is what causes the leg atrophy that's common with age. And which also explains why even bodybuilders tend to lose the muscle size first in the lower body. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because I have an article coming up in my Applied Metabolics newsletter where I'm going to discuss all of this, this motor neuron effect on, on muscles and why it can cause muscle atrophy. And, and the, more importantly, my article, I, I found some very esoteric research, which nobody really knows about. That, ex that shows that you can actually prevent, in other words, this motor neuron, uh, let's say, lessening or decrease of motor neuron stimulation. There's ways to actually prevent this so you don't necessarily have to have your legs shrink as you get older. 
and this is going to be exclusively in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. Uh, I also have upcoming articles on, on the uh, benefits of nitrates from vegetables, why it, it's more than just an ergogenic aid, how it affects your health, how it affects your thinking. I have dozens of countless other articles that won't appear anywhere. They're only going to be in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. Uh, I guarantee anyone who subscribes, you will learn something. I absolutely promise you. I don't care what your level of uh, education or knowledge is. <clears throat> and applied Metabolics is uh, 40 to 50 pages every month. No advertising. I'm not associated with any supplement company. I'm not trying to sell you anything but solid evidence-based information based on 56 years of studying and empirical experience where I'm actually training and learning by my own mistakes. And I'll impart the truth about this to you in my newsletter uh, every month. So subscribe today, www.appliedmetabolics.com. If you want to, uh, uh, also, if you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. Oh, I, I meant to bring Bruno into this video. Uh, Bruno, my dog, uh, my, my next video, I, I'll, I'll, I'll actually show you Bruno. Uh, don't expect him to react, though. He's tend to be a, a kind of a quiet guy. He'll probably just stare at the camera. But uh, anyway, take care, and uh, see you later.